we'll start with a short survey. Go to kahoot.it, enter this PIN number. You'll be on the sides as well. Um, let's start. So, less frequently than six months, or more frequently, Less frequently than six months, more frequently than six months, more frequently than a month, and more frequently than a week. Multiple times a week is your answer, those who are on the survey. And if you're not yet, you can still join kahoot.it with this number. And put the sound from the computer as well in parallel, okay? So what we see is that not many of you are still on the survey, so let's wait a couple of seconds until more people join. Okay. We'll give the new guys a couple of seconds to join. But we see that most of you here in the room are doing it either between a month and six months or every couple of weeks. We have a couple of people uh, delivering every couple of weeks. Okay, so next question. Let's hope we have more participants by now. How happy are you about your delivery frequency? Don't care much. Sad, I'm okay with it, I'm happy about it. Can you put on the sound from the computer in parallel? So maybe we have more answers, good. Um, so all of you care. At least that's a good sign. Um, most of you are not happy about your delivery frequency. Okay, that's the six here. Some of you are okay with it and a couple are happy about it. Go find those people later on and learn from them. So another type of question, delivery frequency is not enough. Next question is how long does it take for a It's taking months. Interesting answers. Some of you, I mean, the, the direction is changing towards more the months than the weeks. Uh, maybe it's more people, maybe it's something else related to deliver, delivery frequency is not enough in order to deliver fast. Um, most of you are in weeks. A couple, very few number in days, and nobody in hours. And how happy are you about it, about your current delivery time? about it. Some of you are ah, okay with it. Uh, nobody's happy about their current lead times. So everybody's looking for improvement. Even those guys that had it in days, it seems they want probably to go to hours. So next question, looking at something completely different. What do you 
you doing up here? I thought you were downstairs boxing chocolates. Oh, they kicked me out of there fast. Why? I kept pinching them to see what kind they were. <laughs> this is the fourth department I've been in. Oh, I didn't do so well either. No. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her roll! <laughs> I can relate. Some others are even more sensitive about it than that. Uh, probably depends on how far in history you had to work like that. Um, and we have a couple that don't see the problem here. You guys, we should talk outside later on. Um, by the way, do you think those were the ops guys, the dev guys? The users, not clear, huh? It applies to everyone. So let's say we're talking about the Agile and DevOps team. Everybody Learning from it, learning, how far Basically, this talk is about um, DevOps and Kanban as a sane way uh, towards it. I'm Yuval. Um, I'm a coach at Agile Sparks. Um, I come from Israel. And actually, my background is, um, is very interesting from when you look at it from uh, a DevOps perspective. 
I started in IT, in the Israeli Air Force, um, around eight years, doing all of those things that relate to the ops side, actually ops engineering. And then from 2001, I was on the dev side, initially engineering myself, then later on uh, managing and leading engineering teams and organizations. And in the last, I don't know, almost nine years, I've, I've been dealing with Agile. In the last um, seven years, it's been in Agile Sparks, where I'm a coach, CTO, and partner doing all of those things, Kanban, Flow, um, Scrum, Lean Startup, all of those things has, have led me back into uh, the DevOps world, which we've see, we'll see how the connection is made uh, later on. So basically, when we look at the reason that people are interested more and more in uh, DevOps these days, it's a combination of two things. One has been described here uh, in the conference several times. It's the need to iterate faster and faster to deliver better results, to compete on the basis of speed in face of uncertainty. Whether it's uh, Sinefin, the Kinefin that uh, Snowden talks about, whether it's some of you that heard uh, Jeff uh, Patton's talk about, we, we are going to fail. We don't know exactly what we're looking for. We need to search for the right uh, product faster. Uh, instead of making too many assumptions. That's the basis that we're talking about in uh, more and more organizations these days. The reason for that is that the targets are moving and they're moving faster and faster. In parallel to that, we see more and more and more accumula work accumulating. We see that work accumulating and the need to search faster, um, being in conflict, uh, with the fact that we're working on complicated systems and if we don't have the right time to deal with those systems because of what Lucy and uh, uh, her friend there um, had to face, we're adding more and more problems, more and more complexity, more and more technical debt um, to our systems. This leads us to focus very locally. We're trying to do our thing and deliver to our local uh, uh, success criteria if it's dev, means that we try to deliver working software, hopefully, but not necessarily something that will be easy to deploy or operate or that will be useful uh, to the users. Not because we're bad people, but because we don't have a chance. We're looking locally and we're focused on making that happen. When that happens, we will see situations where there are arrows downstream when in operations or in production, but and we even know about it, but we say, okay, they will catch those errors. In some cases, it will be their work to deal with it, not our problem. In other situations, it comes back as problems for us, and then we spend too much time asking about, okay, how do we deal with surprises and defects in our scrum sprints, and how do we plan for it? All of this is called failure demand um, in uh, system thinking uh, terms. And this basically creates the situation that we're firefighting all of the time. And because we're firefighting all of the time, we create an even bigger problem of complexity and uh, overwork and unsustainable pace. All of this is called um, basically the IT downward spiral because it's reinforcing itself all of the time, reinforcing, okay? And Agile should have solved it, right? We should have uh, created better solutions with better quality, working tested software, zero defects. We should have put all of the people together to work on the same team. But Agile was, um, the Agile Manifesto came out in 2001. People used Agile even before. But when we go into organizations these days, even organizations that implemented Agile, and for sure there are a lot that have not done too much about Agile or have done something, they call themselves Agile, but they're not really. Uh, most of them are not living this dream, okay? Most of them are very far from it. Why is that? Because when you look at the real world, there are a lot of problems create, making this dream happen. There are a lot of forces, like Kent Beck talked about, 
the forces that uh, are applied when you try to move faster, when you try to really work uh, in an agile iterative mode, they are forces that our current organizations are simply not fit uh, to deal with. It's quite easy to create a new organization from scratch and build the right architectures, the right organizational structure, um, don't deal with the legacy and work well. It will be easy for those guys to deal better with uh, agile and competing on the basis of speed than this uh, jumbo jet, okay? Another reason for our problem is that all of our processes are optimized for efficiency, or most, a lot of our processes are optimized for efficiency, for creating huge amount of things. We learn to think the waterfall style. We learn to think in big batches. We want to create a lot of coffee. But if we want a small, different amount of coffee, or different style of coffee, or fresh coffee, it will be very, very inefficient to create it using big coffee pots. So this creates a real problem for organizations trying to move faster, deliver more frequently. So we do see a couple of companies um, that are doing things differently. This is where the DevOps movement, or I call it the real agile uh, movement, uh, started. These are the web operations companies which understand that they don't have a chance. They are willing to invest a lot of energy in uh, good architecture, in a lot of automation, um, in building the right kind of uh, structures, in having the right uh, types of engineers. And for these guys, th this has been the reality. They've shown the light of how to do this. And a lot of other people are looking at it. These are called also the unicorns in the DevOps world. The stuff you look forward to, you aspire to, but it's uh, typically beyond reach. Most of us will not be in uh, such a company uh, in our lifetime. But looking at it more recently, we see a lot of other, other companies doing DevOps, striving to do this thing for real, not just those companies that have it easy or invest a lot of energy and a lot of money in doing it because they can. A lot of other companies are doing it. If we look at it, actually there are more and more companies that are actually getting business results by implementing DevOps or Real Agile um, based on a recent survey that was published in 2014. First of all, it seems that those companies that are successful in general have an effective IT organization that shouldn't be too much of a surprise. They are twice more likely to exceed profitability of other companies and have a higher market capitalization. Okay? So far, so good. It starts to be more interesting when you see correlation between those highly effective, high-performing IT organizations and the fact that they're actually more agile, not doing agile, not doing stand-ups or scrum or sprint or Kanban, but by looking at their results. They deploy to production 30 times more frequently. Not only that, their lead times are 8,000 times faster than their peers. That's being agile, okay? That's being lean. That's the numbers, right? There, there are probably companies with very horrible lead times in the years in that survey as well as companies um, in the hours, I don't know. Very weird, I agree. But the, actually those numbers are from a survey where statistics doctors uh, went over the details. It's not some hodgepodge uh, survey. But on, not only that, they're not only faster, they're also more reliable. So the, so far the operations people could have said, yes, those organizations are able to deliver more frequently, but there, there's probably a price to pay. It's probably lower uptime and the system is down for more time when it's done, but that's not the case. Actually, speed comes with reliability, okay? Twice the change success rate and 12 times faster mean time to recover for those high-performing IT organizations. So the question is how do they do that or um, how to go towards that direction without 
you know, scratching your company and creating uh, another one instead. So I'm not going to solve all of those problems in the talk today, but I'm, what I'm going to um, discuss is a way to start this journey, okay? And that way is Kanban. Kanban and basically the three ways towards DevOps, which come from um, Gene Kim. Uh, Kanban is very aligned with those uh, three ways, as we'll see later. And basically what we're talking about is first of all to think about the system and focus on end-to-end -end flow. Then after you do that, you amplify feedback loops. And based on those two, you then continually improve and experiment and, in, and improve the system. So let's start with flow. Let's go back maybe. How many of you are familiar with the law? Kind of constraints and theory by Goldberg. How about Kanban? How much do you know about Kanban? Kanban board or attended the Kanban talk in a conference or something. And more or less the same amount have used Kanban or know all of the principles and practices. Okay. So the first thing you should know about Kanban is that Kanban starts with visualizing. Visualizing typically with a Kanban board, but it's not a must. Okay, Kanban board typically takes your process, breaks it into um, the different phases or activities between the point you start something and the point you finish it. And for each walk item that you have currently in your process, you have a card. That card moves throughout the process. And by using that, you can see how much work is at each step of the flow. Uh, and start to understand what's going on. It's basically a way of bringing your design factory to life. So everybody can stand next to it, watch it, and see what is uh, going on. The typical, um, when we go back and look at DevOps, the typical Kanban board that we see out there, or the typical board, even regardless of Kanban, that we see out there is at the team level, okay? Uh, teams uh, either have a task board, the usual scrum style, or a Kanban-based storyboard with their story backlog here, or the sprint backlog here. Development, sometimes just in progress and accepted. Development, then maybe testing then accepted as the sprint done or potentially shippable product. And that's about it. What's important for DevOps is to go beyond that and look at the end-to-end -end flow, okay? So here we see that small team 
and their activities within a bigger context. The context of the, either a bigger program or that single team, but working within a bigger value stream. The value stream that also includes the work that happened before the team, getting work ready to done, ready to the sprint backlog, and maybe stuff that happens afterwards, okay? Because what's important and the first step that typically organizations take when they go beyond their uh, local team agile to DevOps based end-to-end -end flow is to look wider. Look wider not just upstream to what happened in the product owner world from portfolio until stuff is ready for the team, but also downstream, between the point that stuff is done, potentially shippable product, to the point that it's actually getting ready to be delivered, delivered and deployed, the point where we learn whether it's actually useful. So the definition of done in our board, the stuff we try to focus on finishing towards changes between the typical agile development view where done means working tested software or potentially shippable product, to done being works well and useful in production. Okay, that's the real agile or DevOps view. Okay, you, you can notice I'm mixing between real agile and DevOps because the way I see it, and it might be controversial, they're not that different. DevOps is about enabling real agility, real business agility end to end. It's called DevOps because it basically crosses this chasm that was after the team. The team so far didn't care so much about what, after, what happened after this point, but now we're talking about caring about what happens end to end, not just in dev, but also in operations and also in production. We'll talk about it. So the first thing is looking at it. Looking at it and managing the flow end to end doesn't mean changing the team structure. I didn't talk about changing teams. I'm just talking about being aware of where is the work? Is the work here? How much work is waiting to be pulled in by operations? How much work is currently in operations? And you can see here that while I'm Showing this board, it's not really a DevOps operation that happens here. You can see the difference. This is agile while looking at the end-to-end, -end, starting to think towards DevOps, but not necessarily doing anything about it. The aim is to go from here to here. Where here what we see is that basically work is flowing end-to-end -end in small pieces through development, through operations, all the way to production. You can see the difference. These are bigger batches, these are smaller batches. There are waiting points, there are big releases here. It's still agile, this is DevOps. And the idea here is to start being aware of what's going on here that is stopping you from being here. Whether those are constraints, bottlenecks, policies that are creating big batches, organizational structure. This is the first step, visualizing what's going on and starting to be aware of it and starting what to- What are you doing up here? I thought you were down. The next step, since we remember Lucy, is to start to prefer pull over push mode. Okay, that's the second step in Kanban. Don't define everything up front, don't push everything into uh, operations once things are finished, but start to work in a mode where people pull stuff into their um, activity when they are ready for it. And they should pull one by one ideally, but at the beginning they should pull at the mode that they are able to do so. Over time we might improve that. Once you do that, a lot of organizations stop here actually, which is a bit sad because the real power of Kanban is yet to be seen. The, a major part of the real power is limiting your work in process, okay? 
Limiting your work in process basically means that you will not pull everything, you will not push everything, you will have some limits. You will have to work under a diet which tells you at some point you cannot pull more stuff. At some point where you see that some work is accumulating in the operations queues, you will not be able to start developing more stuff. You'll need to go there and help them. You'll need to start to care about them. This is hard. This is very hard, very, very hard. Kanban is about facing this pain and doing something about it. Okay, and we'll get back to that when we go back to continuous improvement. When we talk about limiting work in progress, it's both limiting the amount of things that are in your queues, that are in your um, activities, as well as their size. You should not pull, pull in or work on stuff that is too big. All of this ties in uh, also into the work of uh, Reinertsen on principles of product development flow. I will not go into that uh, today, but if you're interested, go and read this book or uh, this article. We'll have the reference in the, uh, in the slides. And that was focus on end-to-end -end flow. Basically, to start to think of IT as a design factory and apply the flow principles Visualize the end-to-end -end work and flow using Kanban boards. Break the waterfall. Work in smaller batches. Manage and improve the flow. Stop starting, start finishing, and ideally limit your work in process. Okay? That is the key starting point for Kanban. The second step is amplify feedback loops. So what does that mean? Basically what we want is for, at least for uh, each of the things that we're working for, to Tie the loop of, we're doing it, we want to learn whether it was a good idea as fast as possible. How do we do that? The first step is to slice work into valuable, integrative, testable chunks that can really flow to feedback fast. So again, no big things, work in small pieces. The second thing is not even to wait until we deliver to learn whether it's good. Not even wait until it's in operations to learn whether it's, it's actually operatable, whether it, we can deploy it. So maybe you're familiar with acceptance test driven development or for sure you are familiar with acceptance criteria that you define when you talk about the stories. But how about talking about how will we deploy and operate this story or this feature before we start to develop it? How about including that as part of your definition of ready? I call it ops-driven development, but I don't know, the name has, has not yet gone so far, but maybe someday. Um, maybe the free amigos that should talk about the acceptance criteria or the acceptance test should be, should be including some other people, okay? Operations people, but then there is the question, who from operations should be there? The NetOps person, the SecOps, security operations person, the DDOps person, all of them, all of the time, there's some complexity there. There should be something that, that helps us to decide who to involve when. It's not, it's not trivial how to um, make this happen. Another point of amplifying feedback is to be aware that our psychology as engineers, as developers, is such that when the feedback loop is faster, we deliver more quality. Not just because it's easier to fix things when we get the feedback faster, just, but because we also care more about things when we know that we'll get the feedback faster, when we know that we'll know next week or ideally tomorrow whether it's working or not, whether it's operatable or not, there's better chances that we'll do that work than if it's going to happen in months and I don't know if I'm even going to be on that team or project um, and I don't know who will be the people that, were, that are going to operate it. It's different than if it's people that I know and it's going to be um, in a short period. And now we get to the people aspect. So far, we didn't have to break the organization. We just worked on flow end to end or on breaking the work into smaller pieces. And that can actually work, that can actually be a good start. But there's a glass ceiling for that. At 
some point, you actually need to go beyond what um, Agile is doing, which is basically to break down the silos between development testing and the product organization, at least some parts of the product organization. And you have to do something about these other silos that you asked about. The first thing that you can do is that you can create, and the projector is not helping us here, but you can create these sort of virtual teams where there's some association between the people that are working on a certain service or application in development and test, and some relevant people in operations, in deployment. They don't have to be on the same HR team. There just needs to be some association. Ideally, a stable, persistent association over time. But even if not, it's better to have a per feature or per small project uh, association than nothing, okay? Ideally, of course, at some point, you will realize that these silos are hurting you and consider breaking them all together. By the way, a minimum starting point for this uh, journey or something important to take into account is that these teams should be feature teams rather than component teams. How many of you are working with feature teams already? How many of you are working with component teams? Teams where it's, for example, the server people all together and the client people all together. How many of you are working with teams like that? A couple. So before you go to DevOps, think about the feature team versus component team situation. So this was Amplify Feedback Loops. Use smaller integrative valuable slices of work. Bring the operations feedback up front, ODD. Bring all of the relevant people to work together all the way, rather just by association for a single project, a stable association, or by changing the organizational structure to support it. And last but not least, increase the frequency of delivery in order that you get the feedback from production actually faster. The third step, the third way towards um, real agility and DevOps is to continuously improve. What do we mean by that? First of all, the basics. Continue to do or start to do a cadence of retrospectives. By the way, if you're doing Kanban, you should still do retrospectives on a cadence. It's a myth when you don't have cadence uh, and retrospectives in Kanban. You should do them and you should probably do them every couple of weeks on a fixed cadence. If you want some tips, this is a presentation that we use to, to help people with that. I think every two weeks or every week is a good start, but we also see teams that hold different kinds of retrospectives more frequently and um, a catch-all retrospective every couple of weeks. Also start to look at all of the metrics that are relevant once you start, once you start to look at end-to-end -end flow. If lead time is interesting, start to measure your lead time or your cycle time. Start to look at the exceptions. Start to look at cumulative flow diagrams. Start to learn what is going on. You will both be able to predict better what your delivery is going to look like as well. It provides you some uh, ideas for how to improve. Continue the diet. It's not enough just to stop starting, start finishing. It's not even enough to put some whip limit. You should create a situation where you are working stable at a certain whip limit, and then start a loop of basically reducing the whip limit, facing the pain. The, it will be painful every time you do it. Finding what is making, causing the most pain, dealing with it. Not a full solution, but something that makes it makes life bearable at that or sustainable at that whip limit. And then go through another cycle of lower and lower whip limits. And as you do that, your cycle times or lead times will improve. Your process will improve. You'll be better uh, positioned to compete on the basis of speed. 
Another way to look at it, a very important, although more complex way to look at it, is to look at the balance or the combination of the different costs that go into uh, your design factory. Basically, what's going on is that typically what we're looking at is transaction costs or overheads. Examples of that are the cost to deploy to production, the cost to run regression testing, the cost to run a build. All of those things historically caused us to go for big batch sizes, to go for efficiency. But there is a problem when we go towards this direction. The problem is that we have holding costs, or in other terms, uh, delay costs, or cost of delay. What are those costs? For example, if we have a feature that we want uh, in production, if it's sitting waiting until this truck is full, then we're losing money on it. If we have a feature that we're not sure about what exactly we should do there, if we don't get to production fast, we cannot learn whether our ideas are good. We have to make decisions and continue de to develop based on our bets. And if we continue to, live, to build it based on bets, there is a good chance that we're wrong. So if we need to wait until back, there is a big cost to it. Once we understand that there is uncertainty and we don't know, immediately we understand that there, there is a big cost to it. So our traditional processes are actually more expensive to run than smaller batch size uh, processes. Even if we don't do any automation, any DevOps tools, any continuous deployment uh, stuff, even if we don't do that, just use our current processes, typically it makes more sense to run with smaller trucks from an effectiveness and total cost point of view. But now there's the next step. The next step is to say, you know what, this is reasonable, but there is actually even a better way, something that makes even more economic sense, enables us to compete even better. We want to be here, but in order to be here, we need to do something. We need to reduce the costs. We need to reduce the, the cost of the overheads or the transaction costs. We need to invest in some things. Those things are, for example, in this case, some DevOps tools. That's the reason, actually, that people, when they talk about DevOps, they only talk about those things. Those are the tools that you need in order to enable you to run faster. But running faster is a bigger thing. It is an end-to-end -end system thing. Tools are just part of it, an important part, but just part of it. And this thinking, actually, Seeing all of this picture can actually enable you to build an ROI model for why to use those tools and where, which tools to use earlier and which tools to put in later on. Which tools are required to make this reduction in the transaction overhead or this reduction? Which tools are required for the biggest batch size problem that you have right now? And which tools are actually required for something that's already okay? It's not the constraint in your system right now. Most of you will probably be in this area. This is what we call the horses in the, or what they call the horses in the DevOps world. The unicorns are doing continuous delivery and are here. But you shouldn't necessarily be there. Continuous delivery uh, is synonymous with DevOps in some circles, but it shouldn't be. It's one way of doing DevOps, probably a way that's not that relevant for most of the IT and product development organizations, at least in the next couple of years. So continuous improvement was to continue to do retrospectives, to sense and respond to flow and feedback problem. Measure flow, cycle times, aim to reduce the average and the variability. Reduce your working process, continue the diet. Accelerate the delivery loop to surface the next opportunities for improvement and collaborate with everyone throughout the value stream, whether it's in dev and ops, everyone together to study what's going on in your system and design and run experiments that should aim at improving your flow. 
at some point, or most of the time maybe, the improvement that you do should be gradual or evolutionary. At some points, you might realize that you need something bigger. For example, an organizational change toward feature teams, or to break the silo between dev and ops. It's probably the, a mix between those revolutionary and evolutionary types of improvements that make sense um, in reality. So those were the three ways towards DevOps. If you want to read more about those three ways, about DevOps in general, a highly recommended book, actually a must read book, is The Phoenix Project by uh, Gene Kim and Kevin Burr. If you want even more reading around the subject, then here are a couple of more books. The Continuous Delivery book, Lean Startup, Principles of Product Development Flow, Kanban, my book, Holy Land Kanban, where there's actually a discount for you guys in the conference. And if books are not enough, we're always there. We have, um, we are based in Israel, but we have an office uh, and activity in India, in Pune. Um, Prasad over there next to Ares in the back is our guy there. Um, and that's all. And if you want, we have nice calendars that uh, Prasad created with some uh, Lean Kanban DevOps ideas um, for the year. You can come here and uh, take your calendar. I don't know how many they are, so rush if you want. Um, and that's about it. Let's see if we have time for questions. We're three minutes past, but let's take one or two questions. And later on, if you want, we'll do it. Good question. So let me make it more concrete. Let's say your teams are doing Scrum. The question was, if you want to do DevOps, do you recommend using a Scrumban or Kanban, right? So I would say that regardless of what you use at the team level, whether it is a Scrum or Kanban or Scrumban, I would probably add Kanban to look at the end-to-end -end level. Um, so that's a mix of Scrum and Kanban. I personally believe, um, and maybe I'm uh, not that objective, I believe that Scrumban is a good idea for any team, regardless of whether uh, they're trying to go towards DevOps or not. The thinking about flow is something that is good for Scrum teams uh, as well and helps with a lot of the Scrum bots. I believe that's actually better in most cases than pure uh, Kanban team level. But looking at the end-to-end -end beyond the teams, Kanban is the thing that goes best with uh, DevOps. This would be what we're seeing in the field. Last question. Yep. Um, I believe an important starting point for having effective DevOps teams is to work with feature teams. Um, because if you work with a couple of component teams and each one of them think about how to bring to operations their own component, then who thinks about integration about the, oper the oper integration of the operational stuff? So um, I, I think it's probably going to work much better with the feature teams. Uh, which makes sense because Agile in general works much better with uh, feature teams than uh, component teams. It's harder, but it works much better. It's not that DevOps cannot work with component teams. It's not that DevOps cannot work with DevOps teams, okay, with teams end to end. You can start with visualizing and being, being aware of the flow and just making sure that you know what is going on and you're aware of your bottlenecks and batch sizes and start to do things about it. And at least start to bring the, to the managers of the different functions to work on that end-to-end -end flow and improve it. We've seen several large customers, very large customers, who started their journey towards DevOps that way. But the role of 
doing that Kanban step is again to make sure you're aware of your glass ceiling, make sure you're aware of your problem and create the energies and the, um, and the confidence that changing the structure or at least the work structure rather than uh, the HR structure to be more oriented around the end-to-end -end value stream or in other terms, people team, okay? Okay, so thank you everyone. I'll be outside if you have more questions. <laughs>